are you going in Spain?
greetings this beautiful day. If we were in where the Orthodox churches are in Greece and in Russia and those different places, the formal greeting for Easter is, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And this goes on at least for a full week, and some people carry it even longer than that. So I think we just need to remember why we're here today and the joyfulness of the day. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let us stand and sing praises to our risen Lord. Alleluia. We can rejoice and sing. We have hope and help as he walks with us along the way because he lives.
friends, it is a good day. Happy Easter. So the organ's going to uh, shake the rafters, we're going to ring bells, the choir is going to sing, we're still going to beat the Presbyterians to breakfast. It is a good day. Would you turn to somebody next to you, wish them Happy Easter, and let them know uh, you're glad they're here. Friends, uh, as uh, many of you know, uh, I, I love to open our uh, services uh, with poems as uh, opening prayers. And uh, Malcolm Geit, one of my favorite poets, uh, penned uh, a sonnet, actually. I'm not going to sing it for you, though. You're welcome. Um, but I am going to uh, read it for you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this is the one that he uh, posted to his uh, blog this morning, and uh, I want you to hear it as, as a prayer as we uh, continue to worship and as we celebrate that Christ is risen. This is his Easter poem or sonnet. He blesses every love which weeps and grieves, and now he blesses her who stood and wept and would not be consoled or leave her love side. The last touching place but watched as low light crept up from the east, a sound behind her stirs, a scattering of bright bird song through the air. She turns but can't focus through her tears or recognize the gardener standing there. She hardly hears his gentle question, why? Why are you weeping? Or see the play of light that brightens as she chokes out her reply, they took my love away. My day is like night. And then she turns and she hears her name. She hears love say the words that turn her night and ours today. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> well, let me invite Cynthia. There you are, Cynthia. Cynthia is going to come up front and she's going to share some time with our kids. If the kids want to come up front and uh, spend some time with Cynthia, I know she's got uh, some things for you up here, so feel free to come on down. Well, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Oh, my stars, you don't sound very happy. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. All right, because it is a happy day, isn't it? I'm going to read you a story out of my favorite rhyme Bible, and it's the story of today. Why today is a happy day. Do you want me to show you pictures, too? Okay. Jesus is alive. Early Sunday morning, before the light of day, an angel came from heaven and rolled the stone away. Later on, some women came and looked into the tomb, but Jesus wasn't in there. 
It was an empty room. So there's two ladies standing there. Can you see? The women told the others, he's gone, what will we do? So John and Peter ran to see if what they said was true. They saw the strips of cloth that were laying on the ground, but when they looked for Jesus, he was nowhere to be found. He was nowhere to be found. You see it's empty, just some strips of cloth there, right? Do you guys know how this ends? Don't tell me. John and Peter went away, but Mary stayed and cried. Kneeling down beside the tomb, she took a look inside. Imagine her surprise when she looked inside the tomb and saw two angels dressed in white sitting in that room. So now what's in there? Angels. Yes. Okay. We're going to continue on here. I want to know where Jesus is, Mary sobbed and said, but suddenly she heard a sound that made her turn her head. She thought it was the gardener, so she pleaded with the man, I want to know where Jesus is. Please tell me if you can. Look at Mary's face. Is she happy or sad? She's sad. Do you see her tears? She's wanting to know where her friend is that was supposed to be in the tomb. But when the man said, Mary, she lifted up her head. This man was not the gardener. It's Jesus, Mary said. Jesus came alive again that happy Easter day. He bled and died, then rose again to take our sins away. That's the happy part of the story, right? They were sad because their friend had died, but their friend Jesus is alive again. That's a cool thing. And do you know why it's so cool? Why? You don't know. <laughs> Tell me if you know or think you know why that's so cool. Why is it so cool? Because it is so happy. Because we get to rejoice because Jesus died and rose again and that tomb is empty and he's alive. That we too get to live and be blessed and be happy. That's the cool thing. Now right behind me is a little tiny playset. And you can look at that playset. It's wooden right there. And do you see the cross? And do you see the angel? And do you see the guard at the door? Do you see the little soldier there? And do you see the ladies? Okay, I need, Alex, can you go move the little tiny stone and show the kids what's inside? There's the wrappings, and there's no <laughs> Jesus. Now look behind. It's okay. There's our Jesus. He's now popped out, and he's alive again, and we can rejoice in that. So today, when you're doing fun things like maybe hunting for Easter eggs, do you do that at your house? Yeah. Do you eat candy? Yeah. Yes, yes, and so there, the bunny has already hidden them, right? The bunny is the other story of Easter. <laughs> but we'll, we'll focus on Jesus today, but, but we do like that bunny, and that bunny is pretty cool, huh? So while you're thinking about the Easter bunny, and you're hiding or finding the eggs, and having fun and eating candy, I want you to remember in your heart of hearts that the reason that we get to do all of these cool things is because Jesus came 
for you because Jesus loves each one of you so very, very much. Now, I have something for you, two things. I have one thing that's special for Buzzy that I need to give him. His is a little different than yours. When you do hunt Easter eggs and you go to a Easter egg hunt, what's the one egg you're looking for? Eggs, right? All colored eggs are good, but there seems to be like one special one. It's a which one? A sparkly one? What color is it? It's a yellow one? Gold. We're looking for the gold egg. And how many of you get disappointed if you don't find the golden egg? I talked to a young man yesterday. Thank you for your honesty. I, <laughs> let's be real. How many of us are disappointed when we don't find the golden egg? You know, okay. I talked to a young man yesterday after the Easter egg hunt, and he was disappointed because he didn't get to find the golden egg. So today I want you to know I brought you each a golden egg so you would feel special. And I have a worksheet for you that you can do at your pew or that you can take with you downstairs to go see Jocelyn, okay, for activity time. So don't leave here till I give you something special. But is there one among us that would say our closing prayer today? Who's brave? Any brave ones to say the prayer? Okay, Alex? Yeah, I am super brave. son Jesus come and die for us and thank you for raising him from the dead and wiping our sins from our bodies and from our minds. We uh, thank you for everything you've done for us from this Easter to all the Easter's to come and all the Easter's that have come before us. And thank you for all the Christians in the world. And thank you for all our family, friends, and everyone else here today everyone that we will ever meet and everyone we have ever met. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, don't leave till I have trinkets and toys. All righty. Alex, I'm going to have you help hand these out, and when you find the one that has the bee, here's bees, there's buzz, there's buzzies. Okay. Everybody else gets a golden egg. And everybody gets a worksheet packet. Alrighty, you can head downstairs with Jocelyn or back to your parents. You get one? You get one of those. Well, in just a few moments, I'm going to invite our ushers to uh, come and take our morning offering. And, you know, especially on days like today, it's uh, good to be reminded about who we are and what we are about as a, a church here at Kennewick First United Methodist Church. That when we celebrate Easter, we often think that this is the culmination. But in reality, it's just the beginning of what we believe God has called us to be and what we're to be about in the world. 
Uh, we've been called to, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, and to love God with all that we are. And when we support the church with the things that we do, whether it's feeding folks that are hungry, whether it's helping uh, to, to bring justice in places where systems have pushed people to the margins, wherever it is that we come here, we want to do so with the joy of knowing that God loves us and we can share that love with our neighbors. And so thank you for supporting our church, whether it's with your finances or your volunteer hours and helping us be the kind of church that brings about a kingdom of God that loves God and loves our neighbors. So uh, as our uh, bell choir is going to play a special song for us during our, our offering as our offertory, but would our ushers please come and receive our uh, offering this morning. Friends, we're going to spend some time in prayer together, uh, mostly so that the guys playing those big bells get a chance to catch your breath after that. But anyway, I'm going to lead us through a, a liturgy together, and we're going to spend some time celebrating and worshiping this God of love. We're going to take a few moments to, 
be able to lift the worries and the concerns that we have for ourselves, for our neighbors, and then we're going to spend some time praying for our nation, for our world, and then we'll finally finish by reciting the Lord's Prayer. The words will be up on the screen behind me if you need a reminder of those words. But friends, rather than me praying on your behalf, let's spend some time together in prayer. Would you join me as we pray? Lord, we gather on this special day, a day of celebration where we rejoice that love wins. Lord, we pray that as we gather here, your spirit would flood these aisles, that we would feel your joy, your love, and your grace poured out for us. Lord, there are so many good gifts that you give to us. We see the beauty of the creation around us. We feel the joy in our hearts as we experience your love. Lord, we take these next few moments to give you thanks for the gifts that you've given to us and to tell you that we love you. And Lord, although there is so much to be thankful for, so many good things you have given to us, I know that many of us come with heavy hearts. Some come grieving the loss of loved ones. Some come to a holiday as a first holiday without those that are dear to us. Some of us come in places that are uncertain and not sure what the future holds. Some of us facing illness and disease or loved ones who are in the midst of treatment or waiting for diagnosis. Lord, in all of those places of uncertainty, in all of those places of need, we lift those cares and those worries to you, asking for your guidance and for your embrace. Lord, we take these next few moments to lift those worries, those cares, and those needs before you now. And Lord, we remember, especially on this day, that you are the God who loves us. You are the one who spoke and creation leapt into existence. And as we make this journey of life together as neighbors and friends, we pray that truly your kingdom would come just as it is in heaven. Lord, we lift up our neighborhoods. Lord, we hear rumors of wars that are being fought on the other side of the planet and violence that sometimes happens in our own neighborhood. Lord, we pray for your wisdom to be given to our world's leaders as we lift our neighborhoods, our nation, and our world to you, asking that truly you would be the Prince of Peace. Lord, allow us to be instruments in your hand as we lift our neighborhoods, our nation, and our world to you now. Lord, in the celebration of knowing that we are loved, in the places where there are uncertainty, and Lord, as we make this journey through faith together, we know that you are the God who's with us. Lord, we ask all of these things this morning as we pray that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let me invite Pat up to uh, share our... Oh, no, we're not. We're going to sing songs before. Do we do scripture first and then the songs? Sorry, it's a, we're a little different schedule this morning. So Pat, come and read scripture for us, and then our choir is going to share special songs with us. I think I've shrunk even more. Get this down where it belongs. The first reading comes from Psalm 98, and it's from the New Revised Standard Version that's been updated That gets to be quite a few words to explain. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. 
He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our Lord. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth unto joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. <clears throat> Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands, and let the hills sing together for joy at the, preserve, at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And the second reading comes from March, from Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, <clears throat> dressed in a white robe entering the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting to the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. <clears throat> he is not here. Look, there is a place where they laid him. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. These are the words of the Lord.
I should have preached first before that. <laughs> well, happy Easter, friends. I'm so glad that you are here with us to, to celebrate such a, a wonderful day. The sun is shining. I'm going to, before I get started, uh, I want everybody to turn around and just look at the stained glass windows with the light shining through. Uh, I get the, the $100 seat up here, but you all, it's in the back of your head. So I wanted you to see that before we start. So... Here we are on Easter. We, we've heard the, the passage of scripture from Mark uh, about the, the women coming to the tomb to prepare Jesus' body for burial and finding that Jesus isn't there. And the, the passage I chose this year, there's a, a number of stories about Jesus' resurrection. And I, I wanted to choose the one from Mark this morning. Because if you were reading along in, in your Bible, you may have noticed that when we get to the end of verse 8, there's a, a little footnote, at least in most of our Bibles, that says the most reliable and oldest manuscripts stop there and the rest chapters not or excuse me verses 9 through 20 uh, are commonly assumed to have been added later right and so I, I find it kind of amazing that that's where Mark finishes his gospel he, he starts this this resurrection story with the the women coming to the tomb Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James and also the mother of Jesus and, and Salome as they, they come to prepare Jesus' body uh, in accordance with the, the Jewish burial rites. And, and as they come to, to see what, uh, what they need to do and worrying about how some, we need somebody to roll the stone away and how are we going to get all this done. And then they're greeted by, at least as scripture says, this young man who's there in the tomb who says, why are you looking for, for Jesus here? He's been raised from the dead. The one that was crucified and, and buried is no longer here. He's alive. He's raised from the dead. And it says that they leave terrified. They're not sure what to make of this. And that's where Mark finishes his gospel. He leaves it with kind of this, this question that's hanging in the air there. Of, of what does this mean? What does Easter mean? You know, I have, I have one good Easter joke, and I've been telling it for 30 years. Uh, and uh, I've even written sermons in light of this joke. It's the only good joke that I have, but it kind of goes along with this. This is a, a great story, an old preacher's story of... A pastor who was doing a children's sermon on Sunday morning and the kids came up and he said, do you know what today is? And all the kids shouted, it's Easter. 
And he said, do you know what Easter is about? Do you know what Easter means? And they said, yeah, it's when the Easter bunny comes and puts eggs out in the yard and they're full of candy. And we get to have candy and then grandma comes over and we have dinner tonight. And the pastor was getting a little frustrated because he didn't think that really any of the kids knew what Easter was really about until a little girl in front of him says, it's Easter, it's the day that Jesus came out of the tomb. And he says, you're right, that is what Easter is about. And before he could finish his thought, she says, and he saw his shadow, and that means we have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> Been telling that joke for 30 years, it gets funnier every year. But it's kind of hard to figure out what does, what does Easter mean? What does it mean for, for these, these women who, I, I mean, <clears throat> this is a, a fascinating story for me. And sometimes, you know, stories in scripture kind of turn into fairy tales. And the, the way that I keep them from just being fairy tales is I try to, to put myself in the story of, of how would I react? What would, what would my emotions be in the midst of all this? And, and I think of the, these women who have, have seen all this horrendous stuff happened in the last few days. The roller coaster that they have been on. I mean, they, they saw Jesus walk into Jerusalem. They saw people throwing palm branches in their coats on the ground for the, for the donkey he was riding on to, in a sense, have a, a red carpet as he came in and, and proclaiming, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and, and wanting to proclaim him king. While on the other side of town, there was an army that was led by Caesar that was coming in in which they were proclaiming him king and seeing the tension in all of that. And then after seeing the, the, the miraculous and, and magnificent parade in which he, the, uh, the, the Pharisees say, why are you making so much noise? And Jesus says, if they don't make noise, the very stones will cry out. And then as they see that, that high moment and they, they share a, a, a Passover meal and, and they go through all of the ritual and the ceremony that's happening and then in the middle of the night Jesus is arrested and taken and tried in kind of a, a make-believe court for lack of a better word and they they find him guilty and they send him off to the authorities to be punished and the authorities send him back and say we can't do anything about it you all do something and so they choose to crucify him and so they come into town with this this high, high moment in which they say, finally, it's all coming to pass. All the things that, that Jesus has been talking to us about, all the things about how life could be different, about how we could be ruled by love and compassion rather than, than judgment and wrath. And, and maybe this will really be it. Maybe this will be the, the thing that changes it. And then to find it all just slip through their fingers like sand through their fingers as they watch him brutally beaten and as they watch him executed in front of their very eyes and the joy of thinking that this could finally come to pass turns into sorrow and mourning as not only the one they love is killed but the dream of what he was about goes away. And then in such a hurry they have to lay him in a, a tomb without all the proper rites and rituals and all the things that that go along with it and they kind of lay him in this quiet place and it's kind of a sacred spot I would assume for them and they walk in and as they walk into that garden and as they walk towards the tomb and they see that the the, the uh, stone in front of it the door in front of the tomb is no longer there and and they run inside to see what's going on and they find that his body isn't there I can only imagine what that felt like because nobody has in their minds that Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. Nobody has any of that on their radar screen. They think somebody has come in the middle of the night and they've stolen his body. They defiled this sacred place, this, this place where they put the one that they love. You can only imagine what that's like. And as they walk in and they find this young man standing there dressed in white and he says, you're looking for Jesus? He's not here. But before he can even utter those phrases, they, they look at him and it says that they're terrified. I don't know how I would feel. A mixture of fear and a mixture of confusion of what, what is going on. And then to hear these words that, that he's not dead anymore, that he's been raised from the dead, that's crazy talk. People who are dead stay dead. 
That's one of the rules we live by, right? But yet we have this up and down thing. And it says, as Mark finishes the gospel, this young man in the tomb says, I want you to go and I want you to tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is raised from the dead and that he's going to meet you in Galilee. And they're so overcome by confusion and fear and heartbreak and just not knowing what's coming next. It says that rather than doing that, they go and don't say anything because they're terrified. I understand that. I mean, I've experienced the the few times, uh, there's been a few times in my life where I've come into a place that I expected to be sacred, a place that was special and then to find it as something else. I mean, the feeling those women had coming to that tomb, wanting to have an expression of their love for this this person who meant so much to them and then find the body gone and thinking that somebody had defiled this tomb or desecrated this, this sacred place to them. I can remember when we were in... In Vancouver, Washington, we had a, a, a vacation Bible school that was a, a huge uh, production. We had uh, 150 kids that would come to this uh, vacation Bible school. And this one year that we were putting it together, there was a, a huge uh, a program that we put together that was very heavily reliant on our projection screens and our sound system. And we had songs that were going to be played and videos that were going to be played. And this was the place where we came to worship and where we came to celebrate. It was a special place. And in the middle of the night, somebody broke into the church and they ripped all the sound system out of the wall. They stole the, 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 the um, amplifiers and they stole the computer that ran everything. And, and not only did they just take it and leave, but they literally ripped it out of the wall. So there was big gaping holes where the speakers were and where the projectors were mounted and the screens had been mounted. And they just came and wrecked this place. It hurt. <laughs> I can imagine how those women felt. How dare somebody do that to someplace so special? And they're on, still on kind of this side of the cross of not sure what it means or what it's about. But then as time passes, and I love this phrase that he says, I want you to go and tell the disciples and Peter. Buffon wondered, why, why does he... Pull Peter out of there. Especially since Mark's writing the gospel. Mark should have said, go tell Mark, right? Get his name in there. He's not like John. John's my favorite. John, whenever John refers to himself in scripture, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Like, that's the way. The the favorite disciple, oh, that was me. he, He doesn't do any of that. But he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Well, if you remember, Peter was the one who denied Jesus three times. As all of this seemed to be slipping away, he was the one who was losing hope, and when maybe he thought, I'm going to be the next one pulled up in front of this court, and when they said, hey, weren't you with him? He bails on it and says, no, I don't know who this Jesus guy is that you're talking about. But yet on the other side of the tomb, on the other side of the cross, there's forgiveness. There's hope. In the story that seems so confusing as it starts to unfold, there's life and the spirit begins to to move into it. And then there's those miraculous sightings, those miraculous reunions. One of them happens on a beach as Jesus is cooking fish for Peter and his friends that are out fishing, just trying to go back to life as usual. Story of Mary Magdalene, a woman whose life was just so messed up before she met Jesus. And she gets to be the first one to proclaim Jesus is raised from the dead. He's risen. Story of walking on a a path with some people on their, their way back home after all this nightmare that has unfolded in Jerusalem. And as it slowly begins to grow, there's life and there's joy. And the death that's on one side of the tomb, the night and the darkness with a new day begins to bring life. It begins to grow. And every year we come back to this celebration and we get a chance to experience that new life again. 
One of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr, says that the gospel is not the, the ultimate uh, culmination of the gospel. It is not the finish of the gospel. The gospels are just the beginning. The stories that Jesus told us when he lived with us and walked with us, the, the way that he talked about life and how we can have a life with a God who loves us and embraces us and calls us home like a father who's waiting for the prodigal son. And it's just ecstatic that we're home. That's the beginning of the gospel because on Easter we get a chance to to be part of the gospel as it moves forward. Every year we get to re-experience this joy, this life that comes because there's an empty tomb and not even death can stop this miraculous thing that's going on in the world. And now some 2,000 years later, we get to celebrate again. And we get to rejoice and we get to experience that there's hope and there's life and there's transformation because... God is doing something wonderful in us that changes our hearts and changes the world and we get to be part of it. And so we can sometimes feel like those women at the tomb and say, boy, the, the world just seems messed up. There's wars that are being fought. There's still horrific things that happen. As a church, we say we want to stand against evil and injustice and oppression and wherever they present themselves. But boy, there seems more than enough to go around. But every year at Easter, we get to start anew because there's an empty tomb, because there's joy that comes in the morning, because there's a rejoicing in the fact that not even death can overcome the goodness, the love, the hope that flows from a God who loves us and calls us home. Because as I've been saying over and over again all through the season of Lent, love wins. And Easter is the place where we celebrate that. And regardless of what is going on in the world around us, we have an opportunity to be disciples and followers of the one who brings life and joy and hope. That's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we're the Easter people. Because friends, love wins. Amen? When everything seemed black, when it seemed that evil had won the battle, death found it could not keep Christ. He arose victorious and triumphant over death itself. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Let us stand and sing together.
Well, friends, will you receive this benediction this morning? Go from here celebrating that we serve a God who loves us. Go from here rejoicing that there's new life because there's an empty tomb and not even death can power and can overcome the power of God's Spirit. Go from here in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.